first of our Faith Matters Lecture Series that's sponsored by the School of Theology here in the Zoo Pacific. And we do this twice a semester trying to deal with topics that are contemporary as well as are reflective of the values and beliefs of Zeus Pacific University. This evening, we're going to be talking about uh, Rob Bell's book, Love Wins, and uh, I'll be introducing the speaker in just a moment. But for those of you who received Time Magazine, I received this cover this last spring with the question, what if there is no hell? And the subtitle is, a popular pastor's best-selling book has stirred fierce debate about sin, salvation, and judgment. Now, um, it's not often in the public media that uh, evangelical Christian pastors are recognized, but usually they only do it when there's some kind of problem or potential problem. Uh, some people think that this topic uh, is, is potentially heretical, so I've actually brought along my uh, firework things for me to burn some. <laughs> But um, throughout history, the, the, the question of the afterlife has been profoundly important to people in general and Christians in particular. Uh, I think of uh, Dante's Divine Comedy during the 14th century and John Milton's epic poem, uh, Paradise Lost and Regained. Uh, during the 20th century, C.S. Lewis wrote many books on these topics of the afterlife, the nature of heaven and the nature of hell. So that's what we'll be talking about this evening. In a moment, I'm going to introduce our speaker, but right now, uh, Jack, Dr. Jackie Winston has an announcement to make. Uh, just uh, as an adjunct to what we're doing here and an opportunity for you to uh, interact more with Professor Matthews, immediately after this session ends, we are going right across the hall to Duke 122, and we will be having pizza and talking about this, interacting more on them, is an opportunity to have discussion and questions with him. Uh, this is being sponsored by Coram Deo. What I'm going to do is, there's a sheet that's going to go around the room, and if you plan to, uh, if you'd like to join us, and particularly what we're needing to know is how much pizza to get. So therefore, if you plan to come and have pizza, put your name on here. Even those of you who did RSVP, just put on here if you're, so we know about the pizza. And then make sure it gets back to the end. And one last thing. All of these black chairs that are here, when we leave, take the chairs with you because they belong in the room that we're going to. And that's where they came from. OK, thanks a lot. Well, before I introduce the speaker, let, let us open with prayer. Loving God, we praise you for your steadfast love and care for us, and we confess that some of these issues uh, have been uh, not only important to us, but troublesome to us. And it is uh, our hope and prayer this evening that your spirit will be with us and with the speaker, Dr. Matthews, as we uh, discuss important things for how we not only view the future, but how we view ourselves in the present. Uh, bless us, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Our speaker, Dr. Keith Matthews, has been a faculty member here for uh, about seven years. And he's a professor of ministry, uh, chair of the ministry department in the Graduate School of Theology, and also the interim director of our Doctor of Ministry program. Uh, he has written a couple of books, uh, co-written with uh, Dallas Willard, who's a well-known uh, Christian author. Uh, he uh, specializes in teaching areas of spiritual formation, uh, leadership, uh, also an emphasis in, in issues of Christianity and culture and of emergent uh, church ministries. So he is uh, well uh, prepared uh, to uh, present uh, this topic to us this evening. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Matthews. Thanks, Don. I pre can everybody hear me okay? The speakers are working rightly here. We've got to make sure technology doesn't uh, undercut us here tonight. It is, um, it's, it's a joy to be with you. Uh, man, this must be a, a pertinent topic. I think I'm giving the second most popular message this week on campus to the dean's message on sex this last past few days in the undergrad. Um, so uh, this seems to be of, of great interest. 
I want to welcome you to our first Faith Matters Lecture of 2011. I'm thrilled that you've decided to join us tonight to think about a very huge hot topic in many on many Christian campuses, as well as coffee house discussions, that being Rob Bell's controversial book, Love Wins. I've entitled this presentation, Musings on Eternity, or we could say thoughts and questions about the eternal destiny of humanity. I have a couple of questions for you first, though, before we begin. First thing I need to kind of assess is, how many of you have really read the book? Raise your hand. OK. Wow, not a whole bunch of you have read this. Very interesting. Um, with that being the reality here, you will be severely disappointed because I'm not going to go through the book chapter by chapter for you and critique it. I'm here to bring a pastoral perspective. Even though I'm a professor here in the school, my focus is on ministry. And I care about what pastors do in the pulpit and how this book is affecting congregations throughout our country who are reading it in all different places. And, uh, but what I really want to say about this book is it's not just a book about heaven and hell and eternity. What is at stake for Rob Bell in the writing of this book is what kind of God do Christians really believe in? That is the real question of this book, I believe. What is the kind of God that Christians believe in that actually affect their life and work their way out? Rob, through these highly charged topics of eternity, heaven, and hell, seeks to expose the kind of God we're devoted to. And instead of traversing these topics in classical biblical study methods or theological grids, he chooses to engage us as a pastor, using a style that's more poetry and imagination and ample use of inquiry versus apologetical force or techniques. That's the style he takes. He has over 30 questions in the first three pages of the book. Over 90 in chapter one alone. Literally hundreds of questions he bombards us with. And these questions are meant to flood our imagination with what does this mean when we talk about heaven, hell, eternity, and so on. My purpose tonight here is not to hail Rob. Some of you would like that, maybe. Uh, I'm not here to vilify him either, but I'm here to try to make uh, an understanding of who he is and what he's trying to say. I will probably upset many of you that have strong feelings, one in one direction or another about Rob and Love Wins. I'm well aware that I'm walking on hot coals here tonight, <laughs> critiquing him, especially if you match the latest Amazon reviews on the book. Over 500 reviews of the book have been done on Amazon, and the two biggest categories are five stars and one stars. <laughs> Do you see the conflictual problem? This is a tough thing. It reminds me very much of uh, the, the books that Brian McLaren writes. And I co-pastored with Brian for three years when he wrote some of his books that were a little less controversial. He's certainly gone a lot farther than I could go theologically, but I still count him as a friend. And I count many of uh, the emergent folks as friends, even though I'm not theologically where they're at. But this is the state that we're in when we're dealing with a book like this. Now, I'm not going to exegete this book chapter by chapter, but we'll deal with it and its implication for regular folks. In other words, I'm going to critique this book from a pastoral point of view. And what are its implications for those in the church? I'm going to share my perspective of what Rob is saying that is helpful, what could be harmful, and what are other key voices in the evangelical community saying that might add light to the issues raised in this book. So as we begin, we need to understand Rob Bell. Let's get a little portrait of him. Tony Jones, who was the former director of uh, Emergent Village, and we'll kind of chart out 
all the players in the game in a minute here, calls Rob the Jason Bourne of contemporary <laughs> Christianity. I'll share a little bit why he says that in a minute. But Rob is a graduate of Wheaton, and Wheaton College and Fuller Seminary. Uh, hardly a liberal training, very conservative. He's uh, uh, raised in a, in a very conservative home. He's the founding pastor of Mars Hill Bible Church in Granville, Michigan. Although very timely, we, we made this work out. This last week he resigned from his church, uh, and that's been kind of all over the web. He's going to be leaving at the end of December. Uh, and, quote, to reach a broader audience, whatever that might mean. Uh, we may talk a little bit about that. Rob is a highly acclaimed author and national speaker. He's the face of the popular Numas. Now, if you haven't read uh, Love Wins, have you read any of his books? Raise your hand. Okay, more now more hands. Have you seen a Numa video? Raise your hand. Ah, there we go. We struck gold on that one. Okay. How many of you like the Numa videos? Raise your hand. Okay, all right. Don't worry, I won't let the, you, you detractors, that's okay. You just don't have to say anything. Um, in January, January 2007, the churchreport.com, Bell was named number 10 in their list of the 50 most influential Christians in America. Time Magazine named him one of, one of the 2011 Time 100, the, uh, the annual list of the 100 most influential people in the world. Um, he's, a, he's a big guy on the stage. Uh, a lot of people are listening to what Rob Bell has to say. Tony, lest, lest you think uh, Rob Bell is an emergent guy, I just need to, to, to kind of demythologize that. He really has not been uh, in, in the emergent conversation, though he's taken on a lot of the issues that you would read about from many emergent writers. Tony Jones, who was the director of Emergent Village, wrote on his blog right after uh, the kind of blow up on the blogosphere about this book. And Tony says this, I don't know Rob Bell. I never he never joined up with Emer the Emergent Village, has publicly disavowed the term emerging church in various interviews, but neither has he joined any other Christian posse. I don't think he's a joiner. I think he's a lone ranger. Rob Bell is aloof. I don't mean that in a pejorative way. I mean that in a descriptive way. Basically, he's the Jason Bourne of Christianity. He's a unique communicator and artist, particularly of the spoken word. So this is what I will predict when this book comes out. This is the kind of talk prior to the release of the book. Tony's prediction. The Calvinistas will attack Rob as a universalist. <laughs> Rob won't care. Christianity Today will write a review that expresses some serious doubt and hesitation about Rob's new book, but they won't entirely throw him under the bus yet. <laughs> Rob won't care. Lots of people like me will blog about this. Rob won't care. Some people may even leave his church. Rob won't care. It's a special gift to be a theological provocateur and to be so uncodependent that you can say whatever you like with no fear. And I put in my quotes, in Grand Rapids, <laughs> if you know what that means. Yes. It seems to me that Rob Bell has that gift. Now let's get a few things clear here. Rob is not a trained biblical scholar, theologian, or philosopher. But he is a pastor with a prophetic voice who expresses himself in writing and speaking through an artistic and poetic style. In Love Wins, he is especially focused on inquiry, literally hundreds and hundreds of questions that he poses about God and about what we believe. And he does this as a way to engage our imagination. His writing is more painting than apologetic. His writing is more painting than apologetic. In Love Wins, one comes away with strong impressions, but little to connect with as clear positions of commitment. That's what I found. Let me say that again. When you read Love Wins, you tend to come away with strong impressions, but little to connect with as a, clear, as a sense of clear positions of commitment. This is Rob's methodology. 
reinforcing my impression of Rob and Love Wins are two very popular endorsers. One is Eugene Peterson, and the other is Greg Boyd. Peterson says this, in the current religious climate in America, it isn't easy to develop a thoroughly biblical imagination. Rob Bell goes a long way in helping us acquire it. If any of you have read Eugene Peterson, you know that imagination is his ground that he, that he writes and teaches from. And, and to be honest with you, if I could give a critique, the evangelical church has not been very good to imaginaries and to poets and to artists. And, and this is why I think he's embraced Rob's book. Greg Boyd says, Love Wins is a bold, prophetic, and poetic masterpiece. I don't know of any other writer who expresses the inexpressible love of God as powerfully and as beautifully as Rob Bell in Love Wins. This somewhat small book, here it is. I thought it would be bigger when it came out. This somewhat small book is filled it's filled with large pockets of white space on each of its pages, along with no footnotes or references to concepts or influences. Its 198 pages could well be 100 pages, and yet it has had a very profound effect on many people. Since its release on March 29th, it has already inspired three books, mostly attempts at correction, or to bring further insight into these issues of eternity. Yet not everyone has been as positive as these two endorsers on Love Wins. In fact, this book has undoubtedly caused more of a stir in evangelical circle, circles prior to its release of any book that I know of in recent history. Here's how the stir began. In late February of this past year, Harper One released a three-minute DVD teaser to the book a month prior to its release. Little did they know that this was fuel that would light a fire. So let's take a look at that promo. We're going to see if this works here. Several years ago, we had an art show at our church, and people brought in all kinds of sculptures and paintings, and we put them on display, and there was this one piece that had a quote from Gandhi in it. And lots of people found this piece compelling. They'd stop and sort of stare at it and take it in and reflect on it, but not everybody found it that compelling. Somewhere in the course of the art show, somebody attached a handwritten note to the piece, and on the note, they had written, reality check, he's in hell. Gandhi's in hell? He is? And someone knows this for sure and, and felt the need to let the rest of us know? Will only a few select people make it to heaven and will billions and billions of people burn forever in hell? And if that's the case, how do you become one of the few? Is it what you believe or what you say or what you do or who you know or something that happens in your heart? Or do you need to be initiated or baptized or take a class or converted or being born again? How does one become one of these few? And then there is the question behind the questions. The real question, what is God like? Because millions and millions of people were taught that the primary message, the center of the gospel of Jesus, is that God is going to send you to hell unless you believe in Jesus. And so what gets subtly sort of caught and taught is that Jesus rescues you from God. But what kind of God is that, that we would need to be rescued from this God? How could that God ever be good? How could that God ever be trusted? And how could that ever be good news. This is why lots of people want nothing to do with the Christian faith. They see it as an endless list of absurdities and inconsistencies and they say, why would I ever want to be a part of that? See, what we believe about heaven and hell is incredibly important because it exposes what we believe about who God is and what God is like. What you discover in the Bible is so surprising, unexpected, and beautiful that whatever we've been told or taught 
The good news is actually better than that, better than we could ever imagine. The good news is that love wins. Okay, that's, that was the fuel. That was the fuel that set off a lot of different things. Now you heard that, you watched it. How many of you thought that was awesome? It was wonderful. Okay, okay. Maybe we're gonna go to the fives and ones like, uh, like Amazon.com here, okay? Um, how many of you think that proves Rob Bell's a universalist? Okay, a couple, all right, all right. Well, it sure took, a, it sure took off, in fact, um, when this, af right after this, well, I gotta, I gotta say a little story here. Um, this was released in late February. I was invited to be on uh, Frank Pastore's show on KKLA to talk about spiritual formation on March 7th, okay? A week and a half after this, I got to the studio for this interview and I was thrilled to talk about spiritual formation and all that. And as I walked in the studio, the, of course the, the speakers are going and I could hear what the topic was. <laughs> Rob Bell and this DVD. And I just knew, boy, I'm, I, and I've avoided Christian radio because to be honest with you, I, I feel like you can get caught so quickly in soundbite theology that I've avoided it. So the first thing is, the first thing I get in there and he wants to ask me about Rob Bell, I thought, oh Lord. It wor everything worked out, but, it, but I have to say, Frank Pastore took this and was absolutely wonderful about it. He said, how can we make judgments about this before we read the book? It just seems to make sense, doesn't it? Well, that was the angle that he took, and I was really proud of him on Christian Radio to do that. But the social media firestorm exploded after this this promo DVD and and it was set off by Justin Taylor an editor at Crossway and after seeing the DVD promo and actually looking a, at a review of a few uh, chapters of the book he declared on his blog Rob Bell Universalist with a question mark and this and and then following this uh, a colleague of his John Piper who's fairly influential across the country tweeted on his, uh, on his phone, farewell, Rob Bell. And that set things off. Literally, tens of thousands of blogs went off on this issue. And before he knew it, before they knew it, they made Rob Bell a bestseller. <laughs> to be honest with you. Oh, there we go. Thanks, Don. Now, again, all of this happened about a month before the book was released. But there were some defenders that have jumped in right after that. Again, this is still happening prior to even the book's release. The executive editor, the one that edited this book, Mickey Maudlin, who was a former editor at Christianity Today, came on and said, nothing makes me more proud than to see a book I edited reach a wide audience. By that measure, I should be beaming over Rob Bell's Love Wins. I am, but I cannot shake a deep sadness about the book. As someone who has spent his entire life in the evangelical portion of the church, I cannot help but be sad at the reaction to the book by many conservative Christians. Richard Mao over at Fuller Theological Seminary said, Love Wins is a fine book, and I, base, and I basically agree with his theology. I knew that the book would be widely criticized for having crossed the theological bridge from evangelical orthodoxy into universalism. Not true. Rob Bell is calling us away from a stingy orthodoxy to a generous orthodoxy. Scott McKnight at North Park and a, and a very popular writer. I've not seen anything like it. And yes, the quickness of the social media have made this such a big issue. Now Justin Taylor might be right about what Rob believes, but if he is wrong, he owes Rob a huge apology. 
I want to wait and see what Rob Bell says, read it for myself, and see what to think of it. Rob is tapping into what I think is the biggest issue facing evangelicalism today. And this fury shows that it might just be that big of an issue. Well, let's talk a little bit about our current cultural view. How could this book get so big? There are voices in the mix here. Oh, I get to use this thing here. Let's see. Oops. Oops, wrong. Ah, uh, there we go. Oh, look at it. I like that. <laughs> I've never got to use one of those. Give me, give me a little time here. I like this, yeah. Popular voices. All right, very good. Now, I've tried to be generous here. You may disagree where people land on this spectrum and this grid, but these are voices that are very popular out in our world, many, written by many folks that you read. Um, we have on this far end, over here, uh, Albert Moeller, the Southern Baptist Convention president, Mark Driscoll, John Piper, Justin Taylor. Uh, Francis Chan, I move a little bit over. Francis Chan's been a little more generous about this book, although he has a book out on, on Bell's book. Uh, I don't think it was really written by him. I think it was written by his co-author, who teaches at his school, at his church. But, but I appreciate uh, Francis Chan in, in uh, some of the ways that he's handled this and considered Rob Bell a friend and has talked with him. We start moving towards, uh, from conservative evangelicals all the way to the progressives. The progressives over here are many of the emergent folks. I would say many of these guys were maybe over here. Uh, if you, you know, six years ago, five to six years ago, and they've slowly kind of edged their way. This isn't static, by the way. See, it tends to be a little more static down on this end, okay? <laughs> I hate to say, in reality, that's true. We get a little bit of that, but we do have some kind of some moderate voices in the mix. Mark Galley, who just, if, if you want to read a book critiquing Be uh, Bell's book, Mark Galley probably has one of the better books out discussing uh, Bell. Um, so that might be one to look at. Dan Kimball, you all know, Erwin McManus. These are all uh, kind of moderate conservatives moving towards that. Kind of the middle range, you get David Fitch and Scott McKnight, who I think have a lot of great things to say in a, in a balanced way. They, they're committed to evangelicalism. They just have issues with modernity. I, I kind of feel like I fit right in there. I have above this, this is meant to be a little circle here, and I put that, I put these big guns up here because, to be honest with you, these voices permeate a lot of the other voices. And actually, when you read Rob, you, you, you will hear N.T. Wright, Dallas Willard, C.S. Lewis in Love Wins. You'll hear, you, they won't be referenced because there's no references or footnotes in Love Wins, okay? You can't tag him with things. Then, then we have Richard Mao, Eugene Peterson, Greg Boyd, and I would put Rob right about here. Tony Campolo, Maybe right there, and then we have our progressive evangelicals over, over the end. Now, some would say they're not evangelicals. That's not for me to judge that one. I'm just going to put this on the spectrum. But these are the voices that are speaking into these kinds of issues. And what you, what you see is Rob Bell, like these others, has tended to use story, imagination, artistry to talk about the difficult issues. Because this, this end over here has focused primarily on doctrine, while this is about, uh, about lifestyle and, and action, has tended to be. Now, those are generalizations, I understand. But we have to try to get a picture of where people are at on this. And these are some of the popular voices in the mix. But let me just say, give some, some musings of others from Love Wins. As I said, in Love Wins, Rob again is primarily interested in what we believe about God. His relentless questions expose concern over a Christian gospel that makes God into a bipolar personality, which, is, which in the same presentation says, God loves you and wants you to accept him, and by the way, if you say no, he's going to send you to hell to experience eternal conscious torment. He rightly asserts that this distorted gospel inevitably produces thoughts and feelings that affect the way we live and relate to each other and the way we view the world. 
This moves Bell to reconcile this thinking through focusing on the life and ministry and message of Jesus. Jesus shows us what God is like. He's not schizoid. Jesus shows us the depth and triumph of God's love for all humanity. Now to the big question. Does Rob's triumphant love of God lead him to a universalist embrace? Maybe. But clearly, he is not explicit about this position. I get the impression that a universalist slide is his hope, but it may not necessarily be his belief. There are a few instances where Bell affirms hell as an option, saying God gives us what we want, and if that's hell, we can have it. We have the ki that kind of freedom, that kind of choice. We are that free. Another place, he says, there is hell now and there is hell later, and Jesus teaches us to take both very seriously. In speaking on heaven and eternal life, Rob convincingly puts us within reach of them right now. Not just as a future hope where we head for everlasting bliss. He rightly asserts that heaven and eternal life begin now. That this life has meaning and purpose. Essentially, God's training ground for things to come. Primarily working with him. In the, in the redemption of all things. There's shades in this presentation of N.T. Wright and his book, Surprised by Hope, if you want to read more on that. These topics are where Rob shines and does service to the church. And yet the critiques sure have come. Some wise critiques of others. We all need to listen to critiques, don't we? And Rob certainly has his share. Outside the blogosphere, which can be a feeding, fe feeding frenzy, some good critiques are worth sharing. Two books have been written since Bell's release in March. Probably the best is senior editor of CD, Mark Galley, entitled God, God Wins. Another book is by Francis Chan. Um, uh, both books, while having great concern at least, don't revile Bell as a person, unlike many on the web. Chan himself says, I really, want to, I really want people to know that I believe that I can say with integrity is that I really like Rob Bell. There was a lot of good in Love Wins. There are some good principles in it. Some things God, Rob dislikes about the evangelical church today are things that I have a problem with too. It should be noted that both Galley and Chan come from a solidly reformed mindset. So doctrine, not art, have become their main focus. Their main concerns are, of course, around issues of Rob's thoughts on issues like atonement theory and the teachings of eter eternal torment or annihilationism. Certainly, these are legitimate topics of study and debate, and they will add fresh discussion to this book by Bell. Others to view on this conversation are Rich Mao from Fuller, Mickey Maudlin from Harper, and one of my favorite historians, Roger Olson, whose blog uh, was very thoughtful and deep and insightful, if you want to check that one out. So in closing, let me give you my pastoral musings about Love Wins, my opinions in more pastoral language here. I'm going to go help and harm. We'll look at things from a help and harm standpoint. I think there, this is one of the things that Rob does that's helpful. Yes, dogmatism in fan fanatical form reduces good dialogue and assaults relationship. Would you agree with that? Let me say that again. Do you get that? Dogmatism in fanatical form reduces good dialogue and assaults relationship. Avoid an attitude of certitude, but humbly embrace confidence in God and his justice in regard to the afterlife. This is one of the gifts that I do believe the emergent church has given us. They have, they have asked a lot of questions and are bumping up against the certitude that modernity has brought in to evangelicalism. And they have trouble with that. We've lost an imagination 
for different ways of viewing theological issues. We should never be afraid of dialogue. God is not threatened by truth wherever it may be found. Even in the words of our detractors or persecutors, our posture is to live in humble confidence, extending love and grace to all. Rob really does help us with this in Love Wins. Number two, is that up there? Yeah. Clarifying terms, this is very helpful in Love Wins. He clarifies terms that are so familiar to church people um, and they must be reintroduced, redefined, and retaught. I try to do this in a lot of my classes. I find that we that have grown up in the church or been in the church a long time, we use terminology so flippantly that we don't even know what words mean. Basic words like salvation, like repentance, like gospel. Uh, and, and Bell goes at these terms and tries to really help us. And he really did this well on his chapter in hell. He takes all the ways hell is used in the Bible now, he has some gaps, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but he's done a good service in trying to help us clarify terms um, for, for our growth. Number three, the pursuing power of God's love cannot be overstated or overestimated. Now, that may sound so simplistic, but please hear me on that again. This is really huge. And I believe Bell is absolutely on target. The love of God the pursuing power of God's love cannot be overstated or overestimated. That is the good news. That is the good news. Do we really embrace the most basic of truths that we espouse found in John chapter 3, found in 1 Timothy 2.4 that God wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth? Do we believe that? Bell makes us think through that again and catch hold of that. Number four, kind of relates to three, true, this is true in what he says, God is not stingy in regard to heaven and generous when it comes to hell. God is not stingy when it comes to heaven and generous when it comes to hell. God's delight is not to keep people out of heaven. He wants all to be there with him, or as Dallas Willard says, he wants everyone to be there that can stand it. Okay? And that's the truth. Some people don't want to be there. And this is where, where Dallas has said some good things. God has made provision in his love to create a place for those who don't want to be with him. Now we can debate over the aesthetics of hell here. And I have no doubt that there is a hell. I'm not sure that we have it all clear, but you can bet that God's love was the initiative behind it. <coughs> can I hear an amen to that one at least? My goodness, right? Yes. You can bet that God's love was behind that. He is not trying to keep people out of heaven. Well. All right, let's go to the harm. Now, just because I have five points on this doesn't mean there's more harm than not. Don't, don't, don't worry about that, all right? Okay. Um, one of the things that was struggle I struggled with was Rob's narrow selection of passages and lack of reference to ideas limits the credibility and dialogue that can happen. Again, not having any footnotes, not having any references to where he gets his ideas, I think doesn't help the book and doesn't help further study and dialogue around that. In Rob's preface to the book, he states, please understand that nothing in this book has been taught, suggested, or celebrated by many before me. I haven't come up with a radical new teaching that's any departure from what I've said, what's been said an untold number of times. That's the beauty of the historic Orthodox Christian faith. If this book does anything more than introduce you to the ancient ongoing discussion, then I'd be thrilled. Well, the trouble is, he introduced us to his interpretive thinking on these eternal matters, but does nothing to link us to the primary thinkers of the past who've given us deeper insights into these issues. I certainly heard echoes as I read this book. I heard echoes of C.S. Lewis. Echoes of Dallas Willard, N.T. Wright, but, but clearly 
Rob was also influenced by 20th century liberal, liberal thinkers, as well as Eastern Orthodox theology as well. But yet, none of that comes out in the writings and, and uh, what he has said. Just by Bell creative stating of a belief did not convince me of its legitimacy. Just because he was creative, he had some good things to say, but it didn't, it didn't convince me in, in, in all ways of his legitimacy. One glaring omission in his chapter on hell was his noting of the stern words of Jesus about hell in Matthew chapter 5. But he never explicated the passage in any way. Instead, he defined the many uses of the term hell used by Jesus and did not enlighten us to Jesus' meaning. This seemed to be, uh, it, it fell for me flat and deserved more dialogue and discussion. Number two, while chiding people's dogmatism, pride and sarcasm have potential opening. And I have noticed this uh, among, if you look at the chart, and, I, and being on the periphery of a number of uh, the folks on the emergent end, I, I think they felt so pushed out of evangelicalism uh, that, that their writing was tinged with sarcasm. Uh, if you've read a number of their books. And Rob had a little bit of that tone in there. And I think that's what happens. That happens to all of us, isn't it? I mean, at, at different points. Um, and it's been a problem with many writers whose thinking moves beyond their traditional beliefs. That's what does tend to happen. Many of us have been pained by our past religious inheritance. And it's so easy to poke holes or even throw rocks at what is still believed by others in our background. Anybody relate to that at all? That happens. But pride and sarcasm do not open up the kind of future we want for others and for ourselves. So I think that this is one of the pieces that, that, that just kind of stood out to me in this. Number three, Rob tends to espouse more of what he doesn't believe than what he does believe. As a pastor, this is concerning to me. It's dangerous for a pastor from this point of view. This is dangerous ground for pastors to guide his or her congregation based on what they can't count on rather than what they can count on in their relationship with God particularly. The local church must primarily be a place of reconstruction, not deconstruction. And when you're in a local church, I mean, we all know the pains of life that hit us. We, know what the, we need to know where the rock is, not where, what we can't hang on to. So I'm not saying that we don't have a prophetic voice. I'm not saying that some deconstruction ha needs to happen. But, but we cannot be mired in such a way in deconstruction that we don't give people something to hang on to. You with me? Number four, Rob appears to me to be a, a little bit naive about human nature and evil and understates its effect and need for justice or judgment. I had trouble forming this sentence, but it, that's the best way I can say it. I, I, it felt to me that the, uh, his idea and his longing for all to move towards a sense of wholeness or heaven, whereby love wins everybody over, seem naive in the face of, of real human evil and the depth of pain and sin in human nature. At my age and experience, Rob did not, for my taste, deal adequately with this. I could not get my arms around whether he thinks this world is basically filled with good folks who make bad decisions or folks that are filled with a sinful and self-sufficient bent that needs a radical infusion of God's life to return them to sanity. I couldn't figure out which side he was landing on in that, and he didn't really give me the clarity I was longing for in the book. Number five, Rob strongly implies that God's loving pursuit continues after death. A precarious position to leave people in, pastorally, I think. I think that's a tough way to go. Um, I think he gets some, some of that from 
uh, on, on the best part of that from Dallas Willard and, and maybe at the most precarious part from, from uh, C.S. Lewis. But let me just make clear kind of where their angle was because he did imply uh, the, the theological position that hell's door is locked from the inside. In Renovation of the Heart, Dallas Willard says, to be lost means to be out of place, to be omitted. Gehenna, the, the term often used in the New Testament for the place of the lost, may usefully be thought of as a cosmic dump for the irretrievably useless. Think of what it would mean to find you have become irretrievably useless. Hell is a place where they, the hell bound, would in the end choose for themselves. Whether or not God's will is infinitely flexible, the human will is not. There are limits beyond which it cannot bend back, cannot turn or repent. The fundamental fact about them will not be that they are in hell, but that they have become people so locked into their own self-worship and denial of God that they cannot want God. C.S. Lewis seems to follow this approach as a part of his larger inclusivist approach. The question remains, if they are holding the door shut from the inside, might at least, at least some ever be willing to open it and join the joy of heaven? This is the question that Lewis is, is dabbling with in The Great Divorce. He seems to hold out that option, which in its full-blown expression would suggest the view that hell is potentially at least purgatorial for some people. After suffering sufficiently, some perhaps would be purged of rebellion and be able to repent, unlock the door, and leave their self-imposed exile from God. Now you need to know in evangelicalism, and most of you know, that has been at best a minority position, if a position at all. So Bell goes down a road that is a little precarious, pastorally. Hey, great intellectual dialogue to have in a, in a university and bat around ideas on that. Not so sure that that's the best place to leave people in the pew. Are you with me? Okay. So these are the pastoral concerns that I, that I had about the book. Um, finally, I want to just say thank you to Rob Bell, to be honest with you. I want to say thank you to Rob Bell for being a Jason Bourne and re-enlivening this discussion of eternal matters that brought over 100 of you out here tonight. Obviously, this is, a, this is, a, is touching off an issue. I believe that if we can learn and we have to learn this as evangelicals. If we can learn some Christian civility, that's maybe oxymoronic. <laughs> maybe it is, I don't know. Um, if we can learn some Christian civility, we might even grow and together learn from the thoughts that Rob gave us. So, thank you for coming tonight. I'm gonna turn it back to Don. Do you, would you? Please ask uh, key questions, and we have uh, a lot of time to do so. So just raise your hand. Introduce yourself, if you would. Stand up. Introduce yourself. This is a big group, so I can get you in the back. Hi. Hi. Have you read any of his other books, Bell and Elves, anything like that? I've read, I've read portions of them. Yeah, I've, and I've gone through many of his numerous. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A lot of articles, too. Yeah. I would highly recommend Donald Yeah, great, great books. I, I think he's done a great service to us, yeah. Yeah. Hi, Rich Slimbach. Um, I was impressed with your reference to Amazon, the spread between five stars and one star, as well as the spectrum. Yeah. And I'm just in the midst of finishing uh, Christian Smith's book, The Bible as Impossible, mm -hmm. where he says that a biblicist approach to Biblical interpretation is will inevitably lead us leave us 
with what he calls pervasive theological pluralism, which you illustrated with the spectrum. Mm. So is the, is the real question, what God do we believe in, or how do we approach the scripture to ascertain an accurate knowledge of God? Because, yes. and I, I think I appreciate Rob Bell not chapter and versing it, mm -hmm. because that would invite a similar approach yeah. to yes. resolving the question. Yeah. That approach, historically, has also legitimized genocide, slavery, subordination of women, right? The mm -hmm. fear mongering among Muslims and, and uh, uh, mm -hmm. indifference towards the environment, all kinds of things that now, as even Douglas would say, that's just yeah. radical, it's offensive. Yes. Yeah. So it, I guess my question is how do we how do we resolve this pervasive theological pluralism that keeps us from any semblance of consensus yeah. over the yeah. most important yeah. theological yeah. and social ecological yeah. issues. Yeah, boy, that that is there's not a simple answer to that, but I do believe, okay. Uh, <laughs> But, 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 but I want to say, though, seriously, I've watched this because I, cause, yeah, I want, no, uh, but I've watched this as kind of an uh, inside the circle with, with those that have kind of moved out of their comfort zone and see those, those issues that modernity has brought upon our evangelicalism and want to move beyond that, but not discard being an evangelical. There are many that want to do that. Now, here's our problem, and it's, it's what I said at the end. We don't have great, we don't have many forums to bring those two sides together. And what we have is we have a blogosphere where people are sh shooting bombs from one side to the other at each other. And we don't have a forum where I think good civil dialogue should be, taking, be, be taken. At least that's been my observation. Because I think, and this is why Rob and the Brian McLarens and some of the others out there have, have used this kind of means of, of doing battle, so to speak, is through art and impression and poetry, going at it through a different angle. And, uh, and Eugene Peterson has been one of the gifts that we've had that seems to get it. He's, he seems to have this kind of mindset for all the years that he's been in ministry and writing. So I think he's such a mediating influence. But I don't know where we're going to go unless we can start bringing some of these sides together to really talk. So Lord help us. Lord help us. Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Emily Griesinger. I'm an yeah. English professor here at ABU. Yeah. Uh, last summer, I went to see my parents in a place far away in the south. Um, yeah, somewhere in the Bible Belt. Okay? <laughs> and we went to a Sunday evening service, which was dedicated to this book, in a way. The pastor was going to preach on this book. Yeah. And I was flabbergasted and taken aback when the, the gist of his message was, you must not read this book. This is going to confuse you. This is, you know, I don't, and I, he was very serious. And so since you're a pastor and you're talking about the pew and what you would the pulpit with a book like this, well, how would you handle uh, your congregation wanting to read the book? Or? Does he pastor adults? <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not trying to be. I don't want to be. Here I'm being sarcastic. Oh gosh. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No. No. I'm. I'm serious. I. I don't know. You know. We have to. People are gonna. What are they gonna do? They're gonna read it at Starbucks, right? They're gonna be. Re you. You can't, as a pastor, put your head in the sand about this stuff. I mean, you've got. You've got to engage it, and you've got to. To help people. You have to use question, use inquiry with people. What did you think of that? Why did you think that? How does that fit with some of the theological things you've been taught all your life? I mean, you, you, you have to be secure enough to be able to try to do that. But there are many places, and, and some of us in this room come from places that there's, there's a lot of fear out there to talk about some of this stuff. Um, people are driven by fear and, and worry over these things. They need certitude. Well, well I think he was driven by a pastoral Yes. I mean, I got a sense he was very genuinely concerned. He wasn't. Yeah. But my first inclination was, well, I got to read it then. I mean, <laughs> 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 yeah. no, because I don't think it's sufficient. 
Yeah. 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 And I, I think that's, he probably just fired the congregation up <laughs> to, to maybe do a little reading. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a, that's a tough one, Emily. And different, you know, look at me, come from different parts of the country. And, and believe me, I, I, I've heard that because I pastored East Coast, West Coast, Midwest, and I know the different mindsets. Yeah. Uh, Brandon Cooney, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to ask, what are, the, what are the implications for the theology of heaven and hell, not that Rob Bell takes, is going to throw them that way, but what are the implications for that kind of theology of heaven and hell upon this life? You know, how do we view mm. salvation, the sacrifice of Christ, and, mm. you know, yeah, just can you maybe dialogue? Yeah, well, I think he does deal with that. He talks about atonement. In, in there, um, he does a good job. He's kind of down on, uh, on one version of the atonement, penal substitutionary atonement, has a little trouble with, although that's, that's a pretty hot topic in theological circles now. Um, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, the whole idea of some say that's the divine child abuse, uh, you know, in some ways they've said that about it, but I, I think that he's trying to broach those topics and he will do that in there in the book, and there are many books now that are, that are talking about that. Um, and I hope in your theology classes, right, Dr. Thorson, you deal with some of those, those things, but yeah, um, I, I, don't think that there's, I don't think that he's avoiding them, he's reshaping the conversation about them. Well, I yeah. guess, you know, maybe specify a little bit, does salvation in a theology like that make a difference in this life? Well, that, that to me is the precarious deal because if, if in fact love wins means that eventually in eternity over the many eons, God's love will eventually win you over, then this life really doesn't have a lot to it. And that is, I, I have real trouble with that. I have, I have, this life has much meaning, you know, uh, about the kingdom and what, what God wants to do in us in redemption. Is somewhat our proving ground, I think. Um, and he, he doesn't address that well, in my opinion. So. Hi, um, my name is John Rickenhouse. I'm a pastor and uh, I'm from school. Um, <laughs> the, uh, you mentioned a book that, um, that was good, a, a good critique of this book. Yeah. Yes. So would you recommend another book? that might have the references, have the footnotes, have those things that discusses this topic, maybe not so much to make a certain point on that spectrum, but that would discuss the topic so that if you, if you have someone in your church who says, look, I read Rob Bell's book, I really want to know more, you could say, well, yeah. here, try yeah. this book, it's, yeah. it's more of maybe a scholarly approach or a, yeah. a, a different approach. Yeah, well, let me just ask some of the biblical guys in the room. Well, right. Pinnock. 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 One uh, wrote a book, and I don't remember the title, but it's, it's the yeah, it's the idea yeah. that uh, that uh, you know God's love doesn't. It's not the openness. Yeah. No, not, not the openness. No, it's I think I'm down with love. Is that it? No, I was going to say anti right surprised by hope. Yeah, you know what? Absolutely. I'd say yeah, anti right surprised by hope is a is a really fabulous book. Um, Yeah, that, that will be that will be a doorstop before you're out of the do before you get it. No, okay. Yeah, su surprised by hope. Surprised by hope. Um, li but let me say, there's another book that was l written six years ago by Brian McLaren called "The Last Word" and the word after that that was far more uh, indicting of deconstructing hell than anything I'd read, and that and that didn't get the, half the press that Bell has gotten, and he does a better job at actually defending that position. Now he, he again, like Bell, doesn't come out where he says he's a universalist. And I'm not, again, don't leave here thinking that I said Rob Bell's a universalist. I don't believe he is. I believe he, he has hope in that direction, but I don't believe he believes that. Are you with me? Does that make sense? Uh, but, the yeah. last, but that's not it. The last word. No, that's, that, that's, that's a little problem. more extreme. But, no, but I mean, it's a narrative form, too, with very yes. few footnotes. That's, that's right. right. Yeah. Exactly. Same, similar kind of approach that Rob has taken. Uh, but Mark, uh, uh, Mark Galley, Galley's book that just came out, is, I, I think, pretty good. I think that would be a great starter to have both of those books and, and look at them side by side. It's much more theological. And, and, and has a lot of references in it, 
has a lot of uh, uh, biblical texts. He, he really does a, a strong doctrinal approach to dealing with it, but not being disrespectful. Are you with me? Yeah. Yeah. So that's where I would go. Mark Galley. Yeah. He, even the novel, The Shack, by uh, William Paul Young, suggests that even the, the terrible murderer of his daughter in the story may someday be saved. And so even that book has a kind of hope of, yeah. of yeah. given enough time, God's love wins. And, and that, and again, we should, if, you, if, if you're in your biblical studies and theology classes, that has been a position of the broader, that has been a minority, small position in the broader Orthodox Christianity throughout the years. So it has not been an evangelical position, though, so don't get that idea. But, uh, okay, what, what else would you like to throw out here? Yes, sir. Um, just wondering how this leaves room for, for God's wrath and God's anger. Um, right. Hey, that's, that's a pretty weak, um, Bell is pretty weak on that. Again, he doesn't, he doesn't address that. To, it wouldn't be to your satisfaction in any way. In fact, uh, Chan, Galley, this is a, that's a big issue. How do we deal with the wrath of God and the justice of God? Or, uh, you know, as, he doesn't, they don't see them as being incompatible. The love of God and the justice of God. But Bell has a little bit of trouble with that. Yes, sir. Tom Jenkins, grad student. Does it, Bell, though, talk about Sodom and Gomorrah as a way of, um, you know, the, his wrath in that section, a way of, you know, bringing other generations back to him as an example? So isn't that a way he yeah. combats the whole wrath issue? He does, and yet you're right, he does. I'm just saying, I don't think it'll satisfy for those that really want that deal, that issue dealt with. And in hell, he tends to focus on, on a couple narrow passages, the rich man and Lazarus. You know, um, this book will just leave you longing. That's, all, that's what I want to say. It'll, leave, it, it'll whet your appetite, draw you in, and pull you in, but, but it will leave you unsatisfied in certain areas if, if, if you have real issues on doctrine. That that's, was my read. Uh, my name's Chris. One of the points that Bill brought up in the book was when Jesus speaks of hell, he speaks it to religious leaders of their day. And to one reference to a Roman uh, centurion. And so like, what, what, where is Rob coming from to say, is he comparing that to hell is an idea that religious leaders should deal with and non-religious non, uh, communities or people groups should have to wrestle with? You know, I, I, can't, I can't speak for Rob in that to know what he's thinking. I mean, he, he really is trying to build a case on a certain slant. And um, it's, not a thorough, it's not a thorough hearing, you know. I think that he has some really good things to say about those issues. But, but did you find it compelling? Um, I, I would see it more aligned, it aligns more with, with who Jesus is and, and what he was trying yes. to do with... with uh, confronting the religious leaders of the day yes. of doing this justice to who God is. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's how I, I saw Rob Bell's point was mm -hmm. the religious leaders need to do a better job of declaring who God is to the world instead of using fear as a come to see who God is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point on there. Good point. Yeah, yeah. Yes. One more. On that point there, too, on this what you're calling, maybe what he's going through, the deconstruction of hell. Yeah. Can you, I'm just curious your opinion, can you entertain the idea that he might be right? Um, the, no, no, I'll, I'll, I have, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get myself fired. Here we go. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, um, look, look, look I, I, I share a hopefulness, but I do not, it does not work with my belief system. It doesn't work in my belief system at all. But, but I, I, well, you know, I, I, should, I should say this. Just, just when, when Bell resigned this last week, part of their, their note to the congregation was also a companion to Love Wins with a lot more reading and st group type study. So that may be part of their answer to try to deal with, with some of those things. But I do resonate with the, the hopefulness and the beauty of God's love. Um, and I don't think that's incompatible with his justice or wrath. Um, 
uh, but I don't think he deals with it in the, in the best way, in, in a book that's all white space, <laughs> you know? Rich. This year we, those of us who are faculty and staff in the room, signed a statement of faith that talks about the saved and the lost. The saved for resurrection of life, the lost for resurrection of damnation. Mm -hmm. So I'm juxtaposing that with the, with, the, with the question Rob asked in the video. Would Gandhi be in heaven? Mm -hmm. That question was once posed to E. Stanley Jones, who was a contemporary mm -hmm. and personal friend yes, of Gandhi. Yes, yes. E. Stanley Jones' response was, well, I don't know, but heaven would be a lot poorer place without him. Mm -hmm. Do you think that some of the language that's borrowed from the National Association of Evangelical codified in our statement of faith has reached a point that is not generous enough given the spectrum of evangelical belief? Your opinion. Dean, de Dean, <laughs> I think, I've got my Dean here. What should I say to that Dean? Yeah, cut the tape. You know, um, I, I think we could reword that better. How's that? More bellish. Embellish. Yeah, I, th I think it could represent the character of God a little better. How about okay. one more good question? <laughs> and then I can take my flat jacket off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. John Thornton. Yeah. Uh, is it arrogant to think that we might be more merciful than God is? That we might be more merciful? Well, you know what? Um, could be. But Bell is saying the opposite, that we've, we've, uh, yeah, we've been more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm but you see, here, here's, here's, here's where the bombs come from. Oh, you merciful guys, oh, you wrath guys, you know, and they all, you know, kind of, kind of have their, their, their debates. And, and, but hey, that's, those kinds of questions and reflection are worth doing. Those kinds of questions, I, I believe. Sometimes we're so fixed in our doctrinal positions that, that, that hey, doctrine is not going to save you and I. It's going to be God that's going to save us here. You know, so, so, you know, we have to be really careful and we can get very pious and very, very uppity and uh, nasty. In fact, the nastiest people I've known have been the people that think they're more, the most right. Amen. You know, so, so, <laughs> yep. So, hey, it's been great having you here tonight. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Have a good evening.